Hi, everyone. This is uh, Terry Madsen with uh, Code Pink. I'm part of our Latin America campaign, and I am your host for today's What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is Code Pink's weekly webinar, 20 minutes of hot news from Latin America every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern. And today we are really um, excited to share the next 20 minutes with you um, in conversation with Ali Vargas. Ali is a Bolivian journalist and writer. He has been in Bolivia on the ground reporting for Mint Press since um, early December. And uh, the timing of this conversation today is really terrific. We'll discuss uh, the results of the October 20 Bolivian elections and the controversy over the pause in those elections, which led to the November 10 coup and, um, and similarities to the Iowa caucus on Monday evening here in the States. But most uh, importantly is to hear Ollie's comments and um, experiences on the ground, particularly related to uh, indigenous people, social movements and the unions and how uh, the interim or coup government is managing uh, the run up to the May 3rd elections. Um, so Ali, I wonder if you could introduce yourself and give us a little background as to your own, you, you personally and, uh, and your work the last three months on the ground in Bolivia. Yeah, thank you for having me on. It's a great honor to be with Code Pink. And yeah, that's right. I've been in Bolivia on the ground for, um, uh, for, for about two months now, came after the coup. And I was especially interested in trying to see how the, the left, the social movements, the indigenous movements, and the movement towards socialism um, are rebuilding in this new period. You know, they were in power for 14 years, and now they've got to figure out a way to to be a, an effective opposition and to be able to contest elections amid all kinds of persecution, threats, violence. And I've been observing that uh, process especially. I've been visiting unions, indigenous movements in different parts of the country, in particular uh, where I am right now, which is the Chapada region of Bolivia, which is where Evan, Evan Morales is from and where, where there are the strongest level of organized social movements, indigenous movements. So yeah, that's, that's been uh, what I've been doing here and that's what I'll be doing uh, going forward as well as the campaign, the election campaign held by this regime, you know, in conditions that aren't exactly free and fair. Um, I hope you're able to be able to observe that process as well. Tell us a little bit about what you're observing um, in the lead up to the, the May 3rd elections. Uh, Moss has, um, has put forward their presidential, vice presidential um, candidates. Can you tell us a little bit about the two of them? And then also uh, in the news yesterday, today, was the prospect of Evo Morales running for the National Assembly upon a safe return to Bolivia for him. Tell us a little bit about the candidates and how this came about. Yeah, so the presidential candidate for the mass is Luis Arce Cacora, and the vice presidential candidate is David Choquehuanca. Now, the, the two ministers actually served the longest under Evo Morales. Luis Arce was the economy minister, and he has been. He, he's a Marxist economist. He comes from a sort of circle of radical intellectuals. Um, and he, he focused specifically, he talks a lot about the transition to socialism through building a new economic model. And he's a, he's a trained economist and he built the Bolivian economic model um, that turned Bolivia from the poorest country in Latin America in the neoliberal period into the fastest growing economy of the region through um, essentially rejecting IMF recipes, um, through nationalizing natural resources and other strategic industries in the economy, and mobilizing that to engineer um, a level of growth and income redistribution. Redistribu and the results of that was that 
the GDP today is three times larger than it was in 2005 when Evo Morales took power. The incomes grew at more or less the same rate, a 300% higher today than they were in 2005. Around half, poverty in this country was reduced by about 50%. And this was all done, um, this all began in 2005, 2006, just when the US was saying that, you know, if you, if you ignore our advice, if you ignore the IMF and the World Bank, then a terrible crisis could, could be unleashed on your country and your economy. But instead, the opposite has happened. The Bolivian economy has flourished in that time. So he's very well respected for being able to deliver that, being the kind of brains behind that. So he will be the presidential candidate. They hope that that will bring him some credibility and be able to um, maybe bring back some of the middle class supporters who have abandoned the mass basically over the past few years. Um, so that's the presidential candidate. The vice presidential candidate is a guy called David Choquehuanca. He's, um, he was a foreign minister under Evo, but he was also, he's also an indigenous leader. He himself is indigenous. He, he, he came out of the campesino unions, the social movements, and he has played a big role in trying to articulating indigenous philosophies and how they can relate to the political uh, revolution that's been going on in Bolivia. And he's, he has the most support amongst the ordinary members of the mass, which are the indigenous movements. Um, in fact, there was, there was a little bit of tension when he, a lot of people wanted him to be the presidential candidate. Um, and when he wasn't, some people were upset. And David Chokiwang himself went to those movements and argued the case for unity, for coming together in the face of the coup. And now the mass has been able to achieve um, a level of unity around those two candidates. And of course, um, this yesterday, in fact, they published the lists of candidates for the legislature, the Senate, and the House of Deputies. And Evo Morales will be a candidate for the Senate in the Department of Cochabamba. He's first on the list, so it's absolutely certain that he'll be elected. The mass normally get about three senators from Cochabamba. So he will, he will most like, if, you know, if his candidacy isn't ruled illegal, then he will be uh, in the Senate after, after May the 3rd. Well, we can only hope that he can, he can safely return to Bolivia in order to run for office. So let me, there's a couple things that you mentioned. Um, and first, I, can, I'd like to just, um, have you say a little bit about, about your background to our audience, because we are listening to you um, as a Bolivian from the ground in Bolivia, but we hear your British accent. And I think this makes you such a unique person to be reporting specifically from Bolivia at the moment, given, uh, given your, your family and your heritage. And can you just say a little bit about that? And then I've got a couple questions on some of the comments you made. Yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm half Bolivian. My dad's from Bolivia and um, my mom is from the UK, from Europe. And uh, I grew up, uh, I lived in Bolivia until I was about five years old. And then I've, I've lived the rest of my life in the UK. But Bolivia has always been something that is, I feel a great deal of passion about. And that's why I've, why I've come back here. I feel a great deal of um, almost responsibility to, to be able to help those here, to be able to transmit what they're saying to a wider audience. And there's so much amazing work going on here, so much organizing that I think the world can learn from. And I hope to be able to play a small role in being able to help others take some of the lessons of what people are doing here as well. I think that's just such important work and you offer such a, a unique and important perspective um, to do that, particularly to take the voices on the ground in Bolivia back to uh, the northern hemisphere, specifically North America and Europe. So it's really wonderful that you're doing what you're doing. Um, there's a couple things that um, when we were talking about the presidential and vice presidential candidates, um, clearly more of a the, the 
goal of returning or, or continuing the economic growth based on uh, a more socialist model. And that obviously is in contradiction to the neoliberal capitalist model being exported by the United States and embraced by the, um, the interim or coup government at the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the rollbacks that have happened since October 20, or more specifically since the coup on November 10, the, the change or threat from public investment in services and infrastructure and national resources to the privatization of, of the economy, which we have seen you know, heinously imposed on Honduras. Are we looking at something similar in Bolivia, perhaps? Is that the risk? Yeah, that's already the direction of travel. It's not happening on a dramatic scale just yet because there are elections in three months. And the mass has spent 14 years saying that, you know, if you elect a right-wing government, they're going to begin to privatize everything like they did before. They're going to crash the economy like they did before. So uh, the, the right-wing parties are trying to to deny this essentially to say no we do you know we, we're not going to slash and burn but i think everyone knows that they're waiting until after the elections to begin the real sort of shock therapy as you might say uh, some might call it the real sort of introduction of neoliberalism but that's already where things are going at the moment so as soon as the coup government came to power they replaced all of the sort of uh, leadership the, the heads presidents of the nationalized companies. Many of the new presidents were people drawn from the private sector, from industries that were competing with the state, um, state company. So an example of this was there's a state airline, BOA, that was created under Evo Morales' government. Uh, it was inc an incredibly successful company. It flies all around Bolivia, uh, low cost. Um, but the the former sort of director of the company was fired and a new director was brought in from the, the largest private airline in Bolivia called Amazonas. And they're the direct competitors of BOA, of the nationalized airline. So they're essentially handing over the state airline to its largest competitor, to someone who was previously on the board of its largest competitor in the private sector. Um, more, more recently, there's been what they call the um, uh, lifting of export controls. And what that means is that a number of cheap food imports are going to start coming into Bolivia. And the uh, local production, what is the campesinos, um, people produce potatoes, corn, they're going to be a lot more vulnerable now. And they're going to have to compete with cheap imports from countries like Peru. And under Evan Morales' government, there was great efforts made to protect local industry, local sort of produce, local farming, and that's, that's being lifted at the moment. But as I said, I think the real grisly stuff is going to happen after the elections if the right managed to, to win power. Because at the moment, they're pretending that they're not going to do all of this. Um, all of the right-wing candidates said, we're not going to privatize this, we're not going to cut this. But all of them are politicians from the 90s, some even from the 80s, who implement, who themselves were ministers implementing some of the worst kinds of, um, of, of extreme neoliberalism. So we know where this is going to go if they win. So, you know, we're seeing throughout Latin America, globally, I would argue, but um, our work is principally in Latin America, the team that I work with and you as well, we're seeing this really, really aggressive form of neoliberal capitalism, this forced opening of foreign markets, and not just in Bolivia, but, we're, but in recent years throughout the hemisphere. And it's a very, very aggressive form of forced opening of capital markets. It's being done in, you know, in different forms of hybrid warfare, I guess I would say, and, and, and soft and forms of soft coups, particularly economic uh, sanctions um, led by the United States. And it's, uh, 
and Bolivia being the most recent example of this. Uh, one of the other things you mentioned prior was um, the abandonment of the of moss by the middle class in the last several years. Can we talk about that a bit? Because I think for many of us in the States watching Bolivia, we were really, really shocked, dismayed, and very sorrowful to see Evo Morales quote unquote resign on May 10. And um, I think part of that dismay was um, a lack of really um, nuanced, deep understanding of the political uh, turf in Bolivia leading up to the October elections and be helpful for you to explain the middle class to us a bit? Yeah, well, the mass as a party has never been a party of the middle class. They've never participated in the party in any way. It's always been as a party created by um, unions, indigenous groups, and was born out of the struggles first against the DEA and the and USAID in this region, in the Chapada region, who at the time were trying to eradicate the coca crop, and also the social movements in the city, the indigenous city of El Alto, against the privatization of natural gas. So that's where the mass kind of comes out from. But when they when they win the election in 2005 with a narrow majority. After that, you get a wider layer of people, middle-class people in the cities, a minority, but a, a significant section coming to the mass, voting for the mass at election time. So after 2005, the Evo Morales increased his vote dramatically. So even by 2014, he got over 60% of the vote. Now, a big section of that is votes from the cities, from the middle class sections of the cities who had enjoyed a, rise, a, dramatic, a dramatic rise in living standards. So around, it's calculated that over 14 years, around 3 million people uh, were taken out of poverty and into the middle class. This is a country of only 10 million people. So a third of the country was sort of um, moved into the middle class. And there was a level of uh, support. There wasn't an ever active engagement from the middle class in the mass, but there was some sort of passive support. But that began to peel away in the past couple of years, especially. I think the, um, the media campaign intensified enormously. There's huge campaigns of misinformation on social media, on um, uh, what you know, WhatsApp group became the primary source of information for people in the cities. And Bolivia is a country where working class movements, indigenous movements, rural movements, they get their political education through their unions, through their organizations, and that's what's kept the mass together. But those uh, middle class sections in the cities, maybe they came from that, but they suddenly didn't have that structure of political activity, of political education anymore. The people began to consume information in quite a sort of individualistic way, you could say, through social media. For example, people, you know, open their phones and see a, a slew of, of, of right-wing memes, um, with high production quality and things like this. And I think this uh, took, took a lot of people in. There's a huge amount of misinformation, but um, a collective hysteria was essentially whipped up in the cities. Um, so by the time the coup happened, there was enormous conflict, violent conflict between the middle class in the cities and working class sections in the cities and in rural areas who had, who were no longer had very much in common, who saw themselves as enemies, and that, that those were the conditions in which the coup happened. Wow. So there's so much. I mean, I feel like I could just keep talking to you all afternoon. So let's talk a little bit about um, what's happened on the ground since the coup. And now we have um, the presidential, the new presidential elections announced for May 3rd. Um, the coup president is going to run for office. Um, which I believe she represented she would not initially. And um, you're there, you've been there since December. Can you tell us what's developing on the ground um, with social movements, with unions, with indigenous people, um, with the coup supporters as well? 
will it be possible for there to be free and fair elections May 3rd um, for the majority of Bolivian citizens? And, um, and, and what are you seeing relative to the buildup to election day? Well, the, the elections are certainly not free or fair. Um, just, I mean, even at the moment, they're not free and fair insofar as the candidates of the mass, including the presidential candidate himself, are, are being persecuted. They're, um, fake. So Luis Arce had fake charges drawn up, invented against him less than 24 hours after he was declared uh, to be the presidential candidate for the mass. That's, that's the environment in which this is happening. You know, the, one of the Senate candidates in this region from the Chapari region, he's a young union leader called Andronico Rodriguez. He currently has four charges relating to sedition, you know, which is the label that they're using to, to just target dissidents at the moment. So we're going into this with candidates who, who can't campaign openly, who can't go, you know, necessarily go to cities easily. You might get arrest or arrest warrants put out against them at any moment. So, in that sense, it's not a free or fair election. In terms of the election day itself, the they've actually the government have actually invited U.S. aid into the country. They're expelled under Evo Morales. They've been invited back into the country to help organize the elections. The actual sort of technical side of the elections. Now, of course, this isn't fair because the USA was an organization that was expelled by Evo Morales. You know, they were, because of the destabilization that they were, they were, that they were causing through the funneling of US funds to right-wing opposition groups. So this is an organization that is essentially biased against one of the candidates, one of the parties that are standing. So how can they, how can they be the ones to organize free and fair? elections. Um, that way, yes, are, are also being brought in. Their role in the coup is now extremely well known and was key. So both of the international organizations that are being brought in to organize the vote itself have both played huge roles in running up against the movement towards socialism, against Evo Morales' party. So uh, it's certainly not free or fair at the moment. And how about um, how about the physical conditions on the ground? Are you seeing um, continued violence against uh, Moss Party supporters? Is there are there physical threats against that particular demographic in general, or is it more directed at the candidates or all of the of the above? Yes, all all of the above. Um, a lot of people are still being targeted uh, as a. As we said earlier, candidates are being threatened with arrest warrants, but also on a sort of interpersonal level. The, there are fascist mobs, paramilitary groups that are operating with um, relative impunity in the country at the moment. So a number of uh, Evo Morales' ex-ministers have, um, who live in La Paz have had their houses surrounded by um, groups of young people known, they call themselves the Resistencia. And these are basically masked young people who go outside their houses. They don't let people go in or out. They don't let food, food or water go in or out. They let off explosives outside the house. So there's that sort of environment at the moment. Um, journalists as well are targeted um, in Cochabamba, which is where there's one of the largest of these violent sort of fascist groups. A week ago, they stabbed uh, a community journalist who was doing a report on um, on some of their violence. And luck, he, that person has now been arrested. He's one. Of, he's the only person from these movements who has faced any kind of consequences. Um, and maybe the police are, are going to start having enough. But they've been working with these groups throughout throughout this whole period. At the Sakaba massacre, soon after the coup. Um, these right-wing fascist groups were coordinating with the police to carry out the repression. Maybe now the, you know, the police will, will become fed up with them and want to impose some level of order. But up until this point, they've been working hand in hand. And that's what, and you know, people who are on the left are very wary about being so publicly. 
not just because of being targeted by the state, by the authorities, but also being targeted by someone in the street. You know, this journalist who was stabbed last week, he was stabbed at a nightclub, um, at a bar. So, you know, people feel um, relatively unsafe, especially in the cities. So let me add um, a comment here regarding that which you're seeing on the ground um, as the run as a pretext to the May 3rd presidential elections. I want to let our viewers know that Code Pink is organizing in conjunction with a number of um, international activists. We are putting together um, a pre-election um, observation delegation for March 21 through March 29. And we're hoping people like you, Ollie, can join us on the ground in Bolivia and report on many of the things we're discussing today, the actual um, the physical ground conditions, how people um, are, how votes are being, how voting participation is being suppressed or not, what the government is doing to ensure free and fair um, elections in May. So that delegation is May 21 through 29. And we're hoping to attract academics, human rights attorneys, and journalists as yourself, as well as activists. Um, we're looking for people who have some prior election observation experience, not specific to uh, Bolivia, but specific to the to the hemisphere. And uh, so that's March 21 and 29. And then also we're looking at putting a delegation together for election day, May 3rd. We'd like people to uh, come with us a few days prior and then stay post-election to not only monitor election day, but the domestic and international response post-election um, day. So I'm just gonna throw that out there to all of you listening, that if you are interested in doing one or both of these delegations to please contact Medea at, at codepink.org or Michelle at codepink.org. And then Ollie, you have been very generous in giving us more than 20 minutes um, this Wednesday. And I'm wondering if there's anything right, in particular it. you wanna share with us in, in, in closing, anything that we, we should add to our conversation. No, I'll just add that I think this is a great idea that Code Pink plan to come. I think the the if the Bolivian regime tried to rig these elections, it'll be because they feel that they can get away with it. Whereas if the more the more the more eyes there are on Bolivia, the more likely they will be to think twice. And so I hope Code Pink are able to come and then it'll be important to publicize that as much as possible so that people know that the world is watching. Well, good, and I'm hoping that um, you can join us and um, perhaps we can have an additional conversation on on, um, on you working with us on that. So, okay, Ollie, Absolutely. thank you so much. I know uh, it's not easy for you to readily ju jump on Zoom from Bolivia, but it was a great half hour conversation with you and I look, to, look forward to working with you some more. Yeah, thank you so much for having okay. me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>